So welcome everybody, thanks for hosting us. Uh, my name is Ian Henshaw, I'm a brigade captain with uh, Code for Carry. Robert Campbell's here, he's also a brigade captain with Code for Carry. Chris Matthews is with Code for Open, Open Raleigh. Open Raleigh and Open NC. Um, and we'll, we'll go through what some of those are. So, uh, so we also have uh, Laura Biediger could not be here tonight. There's a big Innovate Durham thing going on that, that she's attending. Uh, she's the Durham uh, Brigade Leader. And Jason Hibbets will be here. He's a Raleigh um, Brigade Leader. And so we're on Twitter too, so if you're social media, please uh, hit up. Um, so just a history of Code for America. So Code for America was started in 2009 by Jen Palka. So this is one of the many um, uh, nonprofits that was formed out of the uh, Obama campaigns. And this was specifically looking at addressing the, white, addressing the widening gap between the public and private sectors and their effective use of technology and design. So this was something that had been asked for. And so uh, Jen, uh, she uh, admittedly says that, hey, that would be great if somebody <laughs> would do that, if somebody would step up to do that. And finally, she stepped up to do that. And she's been our uh, executive director for since the beginning. Um, the headquarters is in San Francisco, and uh, I forget how many people work for it now, but, but uh, we, we, it, it started out with uh, a major program, which is a fellowship program, and this was uh, Code for America partnering with, I think, eight to ten cities a year. And so there was an application process. The city would actually have to put up some significant amount of money. Um, and have that matched by a foundation or business. Um, Code for America would recruit three uh, fellows that would work on this project with the city. Um, and then they would, they would uh, go to the city. The city could decide on a general area that they wanted to work in, but they couldn't sp pick the specific topic. So the, brigade, the uh, fellows would be there for a couple of weeks and they do a lot of uh, investigation and uh, communicate with all the different stakeholders in the area and they come up with something that they could do in a year using a technology solution to solve a problem. And uh, not necessarily is it high tech in terms of what we consider uh, like smartphones and that sort of thing, but technology that would reach the uh, people that would be supported by whatever that technological solution was. So several of them were like text-based uh, um, services for uh, people in uh, low income that basically had just text phones so they could get information and communicate with that. So it wasn't trying to force a technological solution on that couldn't be used. It was trying to figure out what technological system could be used best for solving that problem. Um, so that worked uh, quite well for several years, and right after that, there was a brigade program that started, and this brigade program is now matching uh, local volunteers to work with their cities. So the brigade is, uh, is a volunteer organization. It's headed by brigade captains, and the captains are basically approved by uh, Code for America. So this is the way they uh, manage their brand. Uh, the, you can exist if you have a, uh, um, a liaison with your city, be it uh, an elected official or <coughs> staff member, uh, so that the brigade now is working in co collaboration with um, the city on some issues. And most of the fellow, well, all the fellowship programs were then supported by a brigade as well. So if there was not a brigade in the city, a brigade would be formed for that city as the fellowship program was going on. Uh, and then there was an accelerator program, which was uh, civic app companies that were starting would go to the headquarters for four months and, and kind of be accelerated through their initial development. Um, so soon after, so several of us, uh, Jason Hicks <coughs> with Raleigh was in the first cohort of brigades in, in the United States, uh, Code for Raleigh. Uh, Carrie and Durham uh, joined the next year. Um, but what's happened here is the fellowship program, you see it's ended in 2016. There was kind of, they hit the biggest cities that, that wanted to do this, but they found that there was this issue about you have outsiders coming in imposing a situation or a solution on a city, and it wasn't, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't the best. So the 
fellowship program now has been rolled under the brigade program. So brigades now have connections inside the city. There's a lot of contacts, but uh, connections with nonprofits and other organizations in the cities. So there's four uh, fellowship programs going on right now in Code for Honolulu, in Austin, in Asheville, Asheville and San Jose, or San, San Antonio, Jose. Yeah, San Jose. Uh, so there's four now, but these are now part of the brigade program. So instead of finding three fellows from somewhere and, and spending some time in the city and some time at headquarters now, the people that are being uh, found for these fellowships are local people. So they have connections and they will stay. And the, the idea here is that whatever happens with these now, <coughs> become something that can be sustainable by the ecosystem instead of something that was, you know, even a year is kind of a short time, and at the end, it, the program ends. So there's, there's if, if nobody takes that up, if the city doesn't take on the, the project, there's nobody left. So if the brigade can't take it on, a lot of those pro projects, the, the uh, experience that the cities had of just being in the program was useful for them. Many of them, that was enough. But some of these programs that were, were beneficial just kind of withered on the vine. Um, so Code for All now is kind of, it, it, it showed up. So as the brigade program is showing up, all of a sudden these people from Poland and, and Japan are showing up to Code for America saying, we want to do this thing that you're doing. This is cool. And Code for America said, oh, I don't know what to do with this because we're Code for America and you're not from America. But we'll figure this out. So the organization is very flexible with this. We'll figure this out. Now what happened was in 2017, um, there was an uh, individual from Germany that came and spent six months at Code for America, and they figured out what Code for All would be. And so this is an umbrella <laughs> so that every country now has basically an organization like Code for America. So there's Code for Germany, and Code for Poland, and Code for Japan, and Code for Pakistan. And Code for America is just now one member of Code for All. So, but there's, there's quite a difference in cultures and political situation. So what we do at Code for America doesn't, uh, doesn't translate directly the kind of projects we do in another culture, but the, the skills we have and the way we go about it are, are applicable. So Code for All now, so Code for America is part now of Code for All. And then Code for America now, because of the fellowship program, which was their flagship program, which uh, occupied a lot of time in the headquarters, they have four major initiatives now that they're doing, uh, which are uh, very large um, um, service for uh, different constituents, whether it be, so CalFresh is, is maybe somebody can help me out. Um, um, this food is stamps, like food, food stamps, benefits food benefits. In California. Um, integrated benefits, so again, this is, um, I'm not familiar with these that much. Clear my record, this is more like, uh, this is the court system, and this is people, uh, how do you, uh, after you've done your time, how do you make sure your record gets cleared properly so that you, you don't have this, this thing uh, with you all the time that, that help or hinders you from work and different things. And then client comm is another one of these things which is allowing people to better negotiate the appointments with social service organizations. Awesome. So, so these are working and these are kind of on a national and a state level that um, Code for America is now working on. And at the state level, like CalFresh, what they're doing there is they hope that that will be uh, replicated in all the other states that, that uh, they make this. And it's basically to streamline the, the uh, benefits programs so that it doesn't, it doesn't have to be difficult to access uh, government programs. It can be easy to access them, and that's the goal. And so one way that, that we can think of Code for America, and I think I stole this from Chris, is that what... Uh, government does things and they provide something for the citizens. Uh, but it may not be what the citizens want. So what Code for America helps to do is bridge that gap between what government provides and what citizens want. I think that's good. So we're, we're at the next slide. Um, so in the U.S. now, we have 77 brigades. These are all official brigades. There used to be unofficial brigades and official brigades. There's now just official brigades. But we have 77. It goes all the way from all the states, I think, but most of the states have one. I don't do the codes there. Don't. Um, but uh, and, and there's 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 several. So all this requires is people wanting to do this, forming together, volunteer groups, getting a support from 
their city and then applying into Code for America to get some support and some structure. Um, so we have those. And I think we, so we have got, yeah, so hopefully this will play. This is a video from Code for America that, that will show you what brigades are about. So Code for America, you saw we have 77 brigades in, um, there we go, in, in the United States. But here in North Carolina, we actually have uh, the highest density, if you will, of brigades uh, per state. So we have six brigades um, in North Carolina, uh, those going out to Asheville, Charlotte, Greensboro. There also are potential brigades. There, there was one in Winston-Salem. There may be again. Uh, we've talked to people in Fayetteville uh, and also in Wilmington. So this is something that, uh, that we have. But we also look, so this is now Open NC, or yeah, Open NC, and Chris is the brigade captain for that. Uh, so we, we try to, one of the things we started here with the brigades in the triangle was, uh, and this started with the Raleigh Greenway app, is the, uh, which was a civic project out of city camp, uh, that in Raleigh you got to the end of the, tra or you, you came to the end of the trail on the app, but the trail kept going because you were at the border of Raleigh now, but now you're in Cary or Durham or something else. And so what our issue is that all our cities have grown together. And so when we start thinking of something, it has to become more of a regional solution for us. And then from that, what we're thinking is because North Carolina has different issues than other states, that we can all work now collaboratively with all six of these to work on things just specifically for North Carolina. So, next slide. so this is so this is a, a video that was done in uh, at Triangle Code for America in 2016. It's uh, so a group of UNC students did a project on. Um, um, uh, again, marketing project or, or public uh, administration project, but it is about open data and civic engagement. And this is Lori Bush from the town of Cary. Hopefully, we get a little better sound on this. Another short video. So, what we're talking open data, and then the other, uh, it's one of the uh, pillars, I guess, of Code for America's open data, others <coughs> open source so that anything we develop in one city can be redeployed in another city with, without, you know, starting from scratch. Um, so we're ready for the next slide, and Robert's going to take over. And we have Jason Hibbets has joined us at the back, Raleigh Brigade Captain. Thank you, Ian. All right, so here you can see, um, this is our... our combined meetup page, right? So as we mentioned, we've got brigades spread across the entire triangle here. So if you want to see what's happening, if you want to join us, if you want to peruse what's happening, this is a good place to start. Meetup.com, and you look for the Triangle Code for America. That, that will get you into any meetup that any of us are hosting. We're all uh, collaborating together under that umbrella. And I think this is actually, this is our live November so that's last month. You can see there's activity going on. Uh, there's varying levels of engagement across the various cities, uh, but there's always something happening. So check it out and uh, join us if uh, you so desire. Uh, we'll around. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so as Ian said in the beginning, I'm one of the captains in the Code for Carry Brigade system, right? And one of the things you saw in the videos, which were kind of subdued because they were very quiet, right? very ASMR like, right? <laughs> they, were, they were really channeling something that I'm very passionate about, and that is it's a way for me to engage civically with my town, my municipality, my government, and I can affect a positive change, right? Just like they said in there, like I see something here and I either wonder why was it done, how was it done, or it doesn't look done right, I'd like to, I suggest it be done this way. How do you go about doing that? This provides one of several channels in being able to do that. So what we're working on, uh, and I also wanted to illustrate or, or bring up this point too, you see code a lot, right? So how many, how many people are not coders in here, right? You are most welcome as well. This code for, right, sometimes is a little off-putting. But let me give you a perfect example, right? Our, our first app we've got up here, this downtown parking app, 
the way we've structured this is we've got um, retirees from a, uh, a home, the Glen Air Facility in Cary, that have a photography club. They're going out and taking pictures of parking lots, so we have ways to show you when you're approaching a parking lot what to look for. We've got other volunteers that are going from parking lot to parking lot and writing down any restrictions that they see. They're counting the number of spots. They're finding where the handicapped spots are, calling those out to us. They're doing the legwork, in other words, of collecting this data for parking situations, right? And then we've got other folks who take what we're doing and look at it and give us feedback. We need people to be able to say, you know what, I, I don't like the color scheme, right? Uh, and believe me, I cannot design an icon to save my life, but there's folks who have graphic design skills, right? And they create our icon. So that's what we've done here is we've reached out to the community, we've engaged in a broad pattern, so you don't need to be a coder, right? Uh, but we do have coders. So we're trying to bring all those worlds together to make the ability to contribute that much better. So the downtown parking at Cary, uh, we're in Cary right now, uh, and if you didn't know that, there's a lot of stuff going on in downtown. And one of the problems that we had, and this actually came up, kind of bubbled up kind of almost organically, in that folks come to downtown, want to go somewhere, but they're not sure where to park, right? We don't have paid parking in Cary, right? So there's not an incentive on the municipal level to provide information because there's no, there's no transactional fee going on, right? So this goes right to the heart of what Ian brought up. We're bridging that gap. The data exists, right, in various locations. But you and I have a need to know when I want to go to this restaurant, what's the nearest parking spot, right? So we're bridging that gap by creating this parking app. Uh, and we're about, I want to say between 80 and 90% ready. So it should be launching here soon. So keep an eye out for that. Waistline, as you saw, was mentioned in the uh, video, we, the, the second video we saw, right? Waistline solves a problem as well. The information of when to put out your trash and when to put out your recycling, it's all on the website, okay? But you have to go there, you have to find the recycling page, you gotta go and look at a map, you gotta, then you gotta look up your address and you gotta find out, I'm on a blue route. What does a blue route mean? Then you gotta go back and search. Blue route, what does that mean? Oh, okay, that means this schedule, right? So we took all that, distilled it down into waistline.net. You go there, you put in your address, and it simply tells you, your pickup day is on Wednesday, and this Wednesday, it's trash only, right? So we took that very labor-intensive, you know, searching process and distilled it down into a simple step right there, done. So those are the kinds of things we do. It doesn't have to always be um, addressing every social issue it's really about addressing those issues that are important to the community, right? And a lot of times those are social issues, right? Don't get me wrong. But it's also practical issues. It's covering a broad spectrum is the bottom line, right? It's again, the, to me, I sum it up in hacking your civic government, right? We're doing good with good people. So past projects, we've had Open Data Day. We have development maps that have turned into development visualizations because everybody always says, when did they put that apartment complex here, right? So you can actually go to a development map and you can actually see the history of that. Citygram, that was another one that's been uh, 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 researched. It was actually developed in Charlotte, went to Seattle, came back here. Citygram is a way that you can be notified of events around you in a specific location. So I want to know about any uh, police activity happening within a quarter mile of Building W, right? And you can be notified of that. Um, another, the concursive platform, the public art, these are other platforms that we've worked with the town on, on, you know, tracking public art, getting, the, the real thrust of those was how to get citizens more engaged with their government, right? Because I think, and I actually believe, that the more engaged we are with our gov in government, the more it will respond to what we want it to do. Right? I, I mean, it's a very simple and practical uh, solution. Uh, but the way to do that is through some activities like this. So with that, next we slide. have the next slide. So for Chapel Hill, unfortunately those folks couldn't make it here tonight, and they're currently under reconstruction, if you will. So uh, a, a little bit of a challenge for our 
Chapel mm -hmm. High School folks here is reach out to them. Uh, so interestingly, the open data project is actually run through the uh, library in Chapel Hill. So when we talk about these open data catalogs, Cary has one, Chapel Hill has one, Raleigh has one, Durham has one. This is a bunch of data out there. Uh, and it, to me, it was always interesting that Chapel Hill chose to run theirs through the library. Kind of makes sense, right? It's information. Where do you go for information? The library. So those folks, unfortunately, can't be here tonight, but they have stood up a couple of applications as well. What's our... Then we can go, and Chris is going to take over. I'll, I'll take or pass the microphone to you, Chris. Thanks, sir. So the next one is Code for Durham and some of their projects, NC Clear Path, which is in a shortest ways for wheelchairs, uh, helping people with mobility issues, finding safe routes through the city, and then when they get there, knowing what sort of obstacles they may have they encounter when they get there. So that's one of the things that they're working on right now. Reentry Resources Hub, when people have been through the justice system and they get out, we're trying to find better ways to provide resources for them. And that's also, uh, these are things that are being worked on in Durham but are actually going to have a statewide impact. Uh, the website, they're relaunching their website. All we represented is a project that they started last year where they're doing a census of the elected officials in the state and mapping that to the demographics of the community which they represent. So for instance, you may have a great uh, county council, but it may be eight men and one woman and they're all Caucasian, but that doesn't necessarily reflect the uh, citizens that they represent. So we wanted to see how that would affect and how it was affecting the way they were doing that. Some of the past projects, School Navigator, helping people find project information about the schools for their kids, affordable housing, NC Food Inspector was a thing that helped people find food inspections, but also tra track back to CDC warnings and CDC issues. Um, open data policing, where basically we took, mm -hmm. the, the, those people took the, all of the data from all the polices about traffic stops and were able to pull it all together and show where there were some bias within traffic stops, stop traffic data, and adopt a drain which is a project that actually came from Boston, which was adopt a hydrant. So people would shovel out hydrants during snowstorms. Then it went across to Honolulu, adopt a air raid, not an air raid siren. Tsunami siren. Tsunami, Tsunami siren. siren. Then it went to um, San Francisco and Seattle, adopt a drain. And then Durham had the same need, so they basically took the same code base, repurposed it a little bit, redid the labeling, and all of a sudden, a project that was developed in Boston and made better in Hawaii and then put into Seattle was now finding its way to North Carolina, solving similar but not exactly the same civic problem. So those are some of the projects they've worked on. Next, please. OK. Uh, the Open Rally Brigade, uh, that's the one that I have worked with. Uh, we do a little bit different focus. We focus on bringing people together in events. So our big thing right now is Open Pass, NC Open Pass. And we have four events throughout the year. Uh, Data Jam, we have a Community Action Day, we have our big one is called Civic Camp, and then we have a open data competition called Data Palooza. Um, we're also looking at bringing together a data portal to just basically make civic data more available for communities that don't have a government portal that would be doing that sort of thing. Uh, community indicators, again, we're doing the same similar things with census data, just making it easier and more accessible for people and journalists to understand. Um, one project that we worked on was a hurricane response, and this actually involved brigades from across the country. So when Florence was approaching, uh, some of them from America suggested that we stand up an app that was originally developed for Harvey and Irma last year. So within 12 hours, we had a site set up that was scraping data off of the Red Cross and the North Carolina State Emergency Management Site, putting that up on a map, creating a text bot for people to be able to call in with their um, zip code and be able to find shelters. We were able, actually, at the height of the storm of Florida, we were receiving 10 times as much traffic to our site as the state's emergency response site because our information was better, more up-to-date, and more friendly than the state's was. <laughs> really kind of funny thing there. Uh, some of our past projects, NC Connects, which was a better 211 system, 
for the state, where we basically take all of the social service index information and publish that for the entire state. Um, we started back, back in the day, even before we were brigade, with something called City Camp. And that was City Camp Raleigh. And then it morphed into City Camp NC. And now it's called NC Open Fest Civic Camp. Um, and those are just, that's basically what it is an unconference and a hackathon. So we basically will meet, we'll have some people come in and inspire. Then we'll have other people within the who are participants talk about things that they're passionate about. And then finally, teams will form to try to uh, work on a project. Uh, what happens out of, after that is if those teams had some momentum behind that project, then they enter what we call Data Palooza, which is a six or seven week code sprint, where at the end of that we actually give out prize money for the best idea, the one that made the most progress, the one that we feel is going to have the best impact for the community. Um, adopt a bus shelter was the first thing we ever did as a brigade, <coughs> where we took the same Adopt a Hydrant project and the uh, tsunami warning, and we actually did it to Raleigh so that people could decide to adopt and maintain bus shelters and make them so that they would clean graffiti, make sure the grass was cut, make sure the benches were working, well, not broken up and stuff like that. So those type of things. And we turned that over to the city for them to maintain after that. So, so that's really the things that we do as a brigade. Let's see what else there is. This is, um, this is just really sort of a description of the ecosystem of the entire thing, the events, all the different groups put on. Um, Greensboro, um, Coder Cross was the name usually given to Community Action Day a few years ago. NC Data Palooza, we actually started out separate as a separate organization, and we merged with them. So they actually are now part, part of, excuse me, <laughs> uh, Open Raleigh, and they actually part of the whole same event series. Open Data Day, last year we actually held an Open Data Day event, but it was half um, Open Data Day event and half hackathon. So we actually had groups from the North Carolina Housing Finance Association and a couple of land trusts in Raleigh and Durham came in, and we actually had NC State data science students actually work on their data. So, for instance, the Housing Finance Association gives out uh, low interest loans to uh, people who are not necessarily traditional loan recipients in areas that they might not be necessarily receiving those loans. There's a hearsay type of thing that says if you give out these loans in a community, it brings down the home values. So they were able to take 10 years worth of these loan, this loan data looking at housing prices and were actually able to show that it didn't affect housing prices. It actually made housing recovery quicker. So that in the 2009 downturn, these neighborhoods that had this type of investment actually recovered faster. And while it was just something we did over a weekend, those NC State students actually got hired on as a, a team to actually work with the Housing Finance Association on a short-term contract to better flesh out that solution so that now when NC Housing Finance Association goes out to talk to, the, talk to their funders, they actually have a better story to tell. So that's the type of thing that we, that's one of the things we do. So I guess that's it. Some of the apps that have been built. Uh, this is a little bit old, but the Community Budget Explorer, uh, our Greenway, yeah, you can see right here. NC Food Inspector, I think we talked about a lot of those. Um, the development map that was built here in Cary, and of course City Grant. So those are really the. Uh, yeah, yeah that, those last two slides were a view of, like, from like 2015 of what was going on in the ecosystem for open right. data and civic engagement. So I just threw those in at the end for yeah, to confuse well, Chris. Yes. <laughs> no so that's what we do. So, okay. so we can take <laughs> questions. How do you submit a project? Jason. Come join us. Sure. Yeah. Come on down. He's got the jacket. Oh, go Sorry. He's, he's got the cool jacket. One dollar. One dollar. Okay. <laughs> wrong, game, wrong game show. I asked, uh, how do you submit a project if you have an idea for something that needs to be solved? So I, I think it's less of a submission as more of a engage on said project, right? So if you have something that you want to bring to the table, the table is big enough that you can bring it there. We'll discuss it. 
and rally around it, see who wants to join in, and divide, conquer, and go forth. So it's not a, there's no rigorous like, well, you know, you have to meet these 12 points to get this going. We're much more flexible, much more open than that. Uh, and certainly always open to new input, new ideas, and that's how we learn things, right, is hearing from citizens what they see in their community, that's what gets brought to the table, and that's what we work on. When you say you could post it on your Slack channel, uh, a good start? You certainly could, absolutely. Now, our Slack channel, um, at least... Do we have yeah, so we, we have a Slack group for uh, a couple things. So Code for America has one, yes. and then uh, or Open NC has one. Correct. Uh, and then in that, individual brigades will have channels. The, the issue with Slack is that your your request will get lost almost immediately, right? <laughs> so uh, the best thing is It'll to come to a meeting and, and and bring the issue up. And, yeah. and it's not that yeah. there may not be the right people at that meeting to get it done. But if you are involved and, and want to work on that or other projects, we always have more projects available to us than we can work on. And and it, it's up to the skills of the people that show up, can we actually work on it? <coughs> so there's some projects that we've looked at you know, in our brigade is that we looked at some of these repositories and based on the code base it has, we can't even touch it. We don't have anybody in our group that does that. And it, yes, we can learn, but that's not the best use of our time. There's other projects we can do um, for that. So. Um, not that any ideas are bad. Actually, the only idea that's bad is we will not help you start your company. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, any civic project, there's nothing as bad. It's just there has to be enough people that want to work on it to make it uh, work on. Right. The only thing I would add to that is uh, the, the latest, um, not really messaging, but kind of mantra from Code of America is build with, not for. So it's not like, hey, we're just going to go build this out for you. Like, we should actually do some discovery and we should actually figure out is this a community need? Um, and so that, I think it's also part of the, the, the pitch process, so to speak, or the discovery, uh, if the project's worthwhile to, to work on. Yeah. Um, I have sort of a plug for the Durham Brigade and a question for the others. Um, Laura has been, um, his brigade um, captain, has been really good at getting some of the government organizations to come in and speak about things they're working on and engage, trying to engage the group for those who are interested. And um, I mean, just attending those meetings is worthwhile. Just to see what's going on. And I was curious, I, I don't know that I've seen that much happen in that line in some of the other brigades. Yeah, so I'll, so yeah. we are we are definitely looking at what Lauren's done and trying to emulate <clears throat> that. Um, we have had, in Raleigh, we've had a thing with my employer, Wake County, and the city of Raleigh to do those sort of lunch and learns or lunch with a govy that we're talking about that would actually allow them to come in <laughs> and do a reverse pitch of here's our problems, here's our pain points, and then Hopefully, we have civic tech people in there to uh, to pull those in and start looking at doing the discovery, doing the initial look at those problems, see if we can figure a way to help with those problems. Um, but we Laura do have, does work uh, for city of Durham or county of Durham. I forget which yeah. one, but so she's able to bring all those resources, network, and bring those resources in where most of us standing up here do not have that. And so it's it's her uh, personal desire to bring all that in. Right. And it's very valuable to have that in, in Code for Durham. So. And for the Open Raleigh Brigade, like, we do a lot of that through our events, and so we're not doing individual meetups. Um, last year, we did partner with the All Things Open Conference to do uh, an open government, open data meetup in the spring. Uh, so we're always looking for those opportunities to partner with uh, existing organizations so that we're not creating yet another new thing. We want to take advantage of what's already out there. And I would add that we also have, you know, in Carrot, we have the relationship as well with our municipality, right? A perfect example of that would be is the town came to us and said, hey, we're deploying a uh, Ask Carry app or an Ask Carry skill on Alexa. Uh, can the brigade, you know, engage? So we have these conversations. They go back and forth all the time. So if there's something new coming up in the town, you know, code for carry, uh, when it comes to carry, is a resource uh, or is seen as a resource for the town to see, hey, is that a channel that we can engage on? And it works the other way as well, right? We can go to them, uh, and I would say, you know, you're, you're looking at some of the most instrumental people that got the open data portals stood up in the first place, right? So the, the idea of the conversation going back and forth is very real and still goes on. It happens differently, as we said, in Durham because they have a different angle, different person involved. But it is happening across the board. Do 
we answered every question. Wow. <laughs> I think you covered this. No, no, we've got one. Yeah. Go ahead. So I, I actually am kind of interested in some of the projects I see going on in Durham, um, the judicial one specifically. Mm -hmm. But I live in Cary, and getting over there seems difficult. What's your advice? And is that something just like Greenboro and Durham have partnered? If I'm interested in other people, in Cary might be interested in that another bridge. And how does how does that work with the cross parade? Yeah. So we are working on that. Uh, that is that is a project underway. Um, a lot of the work is being done through GitHub issues and Slack. So there are and you know video chats and just phone calls. So if there is an interest, I'm sure we could connect you with the folks in Durham and the folks in Greensboro on that judicial record uh, thing. Uh, the uh, reach. Reentry resources app, and we could definitely get you interested, in, engage in that group. So, and then of course, you know, you would work on issues as uh, your time permitted. You you know, pull requests if you know GitHub. So, that would and, be. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, an example of our, our Slack. So there will be a channel for that project. So you know, so if you're not with, if Durham is say the brigade that's leading that, you could get on their channel and say, hey. I'm in Cary, I want to help with that. I can't see your meetings, but how do I get involved with that? Mm -hmm. um, and that would be a, a good way of, of doing that. Absolutely. And did you have a question? Yeah. So one thing I like to, when I'm talking to people, I say, what is the one thing you would want to change about your community or improve in your community? And you know that usually will get us a, a good way to start a conversation. Like, what was the inf what was the uh, thing that you were interested in starting oh, yeah. projects? So I. Uh, am on the board of directors of a local nonprofit called Rebuilding uh, Together the Triangle. And what we do is provide repairs to low income home homeowners who, you know, for whatever reason their house has been in repair or disrepair. Uh, so we serve about 150 families a year. Uh, and, uh, you know, the big problem that we have is the intake process is not getting resourced. And so, uh, you know, we have a 400 family backlog. And, uh, you know, so that means it's a four year backlog. We need to get that down to six months. Uh, the other thing is we're not uh, able to easily identify, you know, clients, potential clients. They have to find us. Okay. And so what kind of we thought about is could we create a you know basically a form with a database that says hey here's the information that we need mm -hmm. for our intake there are a hundred other nonprofits in the triangle that are serving you know kind of low income uh, families that would have the same you know would have maybe a different slice of how do we uh, provide service to those families. So, for example, you know, uh, we might have uh, drug and alcohol abuse, you know, kind of going on in the home, or you might have, you know, some somebody who, who's elderly that needs care or disabled that needs care other than this sort of thing. And so the idea is to, instead of having to go out and pull the services to the individual families, have them know that, just kind of be able to say, well, we can actually push services because we know that this family has these problems. So, you know, no matter how you get into the system, you're, uh, you, you know, mm -hmm. you, you're identified to the other organizations that could provide services okay. uh, pretty simply. So it seems to me like a relatively simple technical solution, potentially, uh, but there's a lot of kind of hairy privacy issues that's and things like what that. I was, that was going to need to yeah, be some sort of informed consent and all that would have to be built into the right. system. And but yeah, I definitely make sure you give us our information. Yeah. We'll we were actually we'll cover that with 211 stuff too. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean that would definitely fit in with some yeah. of the 211 that we've done. Um, so it's, I know... It sounds like the project out of Michigan too. I mean they, right. they're, they're providing food services, you know, uh, sort of thing. And yeah. This would seem to fit right into that. So, I mean, I know what we're, we'll be doing a little bit more this year, maybe one or two meetings more, 
but then we kind of take the holidays off and then we come back in January, February time frame and then we start planning our next event series, start planning regular meetups, our lunch and learn type of thing. So I definitely want to make sure that you have my contact information, we get yours so we can get, keep you informed, let you know when to come and start talking with folks. Because also I know we could definitely help with a quick win with that yeah. type of a, a, an app, but we definitely want to look at doing more of a, a user-centered design. Maybe how do we approach it a little bit differently? Right. And maybe actually improves it to your process. Well, and the world. cool thing is this is a fundable idea. There, there are people in the community who are willing to donate to solve the, you know, because there's another problem in this that is, hey, there needs to be kind of a caseworker that says, I've seen this problem with this family or mm -hmm. this individual, and you know, and so these are the five services, and these are how they should be, you know, right. kind of scheduled uh, yeah. in order to get the best outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a little. Um, I'm from SAS, and so I was thinking, your some of your apps, you know, it'd be be nice for SAS. I mean, you know, you're looking at your downtown app for parking and. We're totally focused on object detection and things like that, and we've got a you know camera out here as you exit SAS now, looking at traffic patterns and so forth. Because Dr. Goodnight hates sitting at a red light. <laughs> <laughs> this is true, and um, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity. I looked at the Florence issue, and mm -hmm. we called most of the the Data for Good program. We called a lot of the organizations but just getting the data was tough mm -hmm. you know we scraped some so we ended up scraping data Twitter ourselves. data right. and did some sentiment and clustering and most things fell around shelters I need shelter I need food um, where to donate money you know mm -hmm. those kind of things popped out but there's a lot of opportunity and I'm sure that you know at, at least within the care we're with town of police too and care mm -hmm. maybe we could find something fun to work on absolutely yeah, so an idea that we just, I, I threw out to our group is something we could present. So, so we talked about the fellowship program and how that was individual with cities, but now it's, it's driven to the brigades. Well, there has been a, a thought at times that maybe Raleigh or Durham could do a fellowship program, but it, we couldn't get it to the level of funding. Again, you need the city and you need a, a, another partner, whether it's a, 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 a commercial outfit or some nonprofits. But it could be a consortium, and, and because we're mm -hmm. in this unique uh, area here in the Triangle, it may be possible for us to do something, a collaboration between the brigades that are here, the municipal governments, and some of the, the major people here, or major companies, and especially for, uh, you know, for SAS, if we're talking about a data-heavy project, this would be a, a great uh, place to work. So uh, I think that... You know, so we, we have the pieces. We have uh, there's some sort of framework that could put all that together, and we have we would obviously have some interest in doing it. So the question is, how do we bring it all together? And that would require some larger discussion, right? But mm -hmm. it it would be definitely something that I think all of us would be interested in talking about. Absolutely. Cool. Uh, Jeff, you have I think it depends on the project. Exactly. I would say you can give as much or as little as you want. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are some projects where we're trying to, if we're doing a sprint, we're trying to meet a certain deadline. Um, if the project manager is really good about that, you'll know what that what that information is up front before you get involved. Um, and a lot of it's, I mean, we're very, at this point, we're very like, we're just going to take what we can get. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. If you have two hours a week, that's great. Two hours a week, and depending on what, yeah. what your interests are. And again, it doesn't have to be coding. Uh, it could be, um, we've, been, we've had some Durham's had su some success recently with um, some mapathon projects where, um, believe it or not, a lot of the sidewalks are, actually aren't mapped, but we have great satellite imagery to show you where the satellites are. We just need to get them on open street maps. Mm -hmm. And so if you had 30 minutes to just, you know, do a five minute tutorial trace. and then trace out some sidewalks, that's a huge help, right? So there's, it's, what else would you guys add? Yeah, so I would say a lot of the work is actually done outside the meetings. And, and we are a volunteer organization, so you can't force anybody to do anything, right? So projects do move slower than what you'd imagine in a 
you know a regular coding job or, or business project type yeah, business, yeah. right? Yeah. So so our time frames are uh, more fluid. Let's put it that way. And, and so we, we try to make start with a minimum viable product that we can get out there and start getting some use for. Uh, but again, some are we have to scope the project. Some of the big cities, New York, where they have, or Chicago, where they regularly every week they have hundred people coming together on projects. They do break into teams. They have team leaders. They they go through the whole process, and people spend four or five hours a week on this sort of stuff. We just can't do that here. We don't get the number of people, and people come on and off the project. But again, most of the work is done outside the meeting, uh, and so it can be done at your time. If you're up at two o'clock in the morning and you just want to do something and work on a project or pull a, pull an issue out of GitHub and work on that, then mm -hmm. we're more than happy to have that sort of stuff done as well. So, I mean, with Jason and I, he stays up late and he, finish, he knocks uh, GitHub issues out. I get up early, so I will see what he's done the night before, that type of thing. So. And then we both go go to our day jobs and then, you know, repeat the next day type of thing. So, so do you share code mm -hmm. globally? Yes. Yeah. Across yeah. America? Yep. Yeah. yeah. And we're platform agnostic. We have Ruby on Rails. We have <coughs> JavaScript. We have Python, Python Django. Um, we have just people doing HTML. We have people designing websites. Uh, so, Markdown language, you know. If you check, you know uh, GitHub, GitHub IO, what is it? Gelling. No, I'm not sure about that, but um, just different Markdown language that the websites with. I want to say Jenkins, but that's not it. Markdown. Just Markdown. Markdown. <laughs> just Markdown. Yeah. Just yeah. Markdown. Plain Markdown. Yeah. So each project will have a project lead or project manager? Ideally, yes. Yeah. Ideally, Ideally, yes. Yeah. 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 Ideally, project that's manager. actually a problem that we have, is right. getting project managers that will be able to herd the resources and continue moving them along. Mm -hmm. um, so if that's something you feel that you have a, a skill set that is something we're lacking that would definitely be welcome uh, to help these projects along to kind of guide and keep uh, the developers and the other people on task. Right. So. so what we've found is that we, we get all excited about these projects, but we're all busy organizing people that we can't actually work on the projects themselves. So I think that's where uh, that's definitely a need that we would yeah. uh, be willing definitely. to have some help with. So the best way to volunteer is that to show up at a meeting and start there? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, and so we share a, a meetup group, so all the meetings in the triangle are on the same meetup group, so you don't have to go to multiple. So, it, so the example, you're interested in the project in Durham, you can see the Durham meetups. Uh, we have people that obviously work in Durham and live in Cary or Raleigh, so it might be easier for them to attend one of those meetings right. after work on the way home uh, if, if you're interested. So, and, and the brigades seem to be working on several different projects, but we, we then do try to work on a few the same as well. And our friend um, Steve Rao over at the town of Morrisville is very eager to get a brigade in Morrisville, so yep. if anyone was there, Steve would be like your biggest fan. Yeah. Good tennis player, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Thank you all for your time. So, and I just want to say thank you to Sash for hosting us. Yeah, thank you very much. So, one more quick thing before we go away. Um, 